Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a todos. Gracias. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this first edition of the XR Fest. As was introduced yesterday, many of you were here, and it was organized by Fundación Telefónica and the British Council. We have today, uh, as a starter of today's session, uh, you know that in the morning, uh, for the three days, there are workshops. Today, the day is devoted to new narratives, and we wanted to close uh, the morning session with this talk in the afternoon in order to delve deeper into one of the great topics that is uh, presented to the media. I've, uh, I'm quite old and I come from a different world and I hear the, uh, once and again that same conversation when the internet uh, appeared, emerged, ev everyone uh, said that we needed a new language, uh, a native code and then the social media came and then the same problem emerged again. You cannot speak in the same way in a social media, in social media or in a letter or in an email. You we need new ways of taking advantage of this new medium and now with this new umbrella which is uh, XR we will have the opportunity to perhaps uh, deepen a little bit into that uh, uh, discussion and to see what challenges and what opportunities are presented to, I, to us by these new ways of understanding and, 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 and experience things. Before we start with today's uh, topic, uh, new narratives, I'm going to invite to the stage. Uh, we have the hashtag XRFest if we, if we want to tweet and we want to uh, greet the people who are following us through a streaming. If you want to watch it later on, it will be on Tele Fundación Telefónica's webpage, the whole link with the whole conference. I'm going to start by inviting Mark Lever, who will deliver a, a brief press, uh, introduction. He is a uh, consultant in the uh, UK government, and he's going to talk about the uh, new opportunities that uh, the UK is offering um, in this area. Let's uh, start with this brief introduction and then we will deal with new narratives. Uh, Mark, uh, you have the floor. Thank you for coming. As you just said, before I start talking, let's ha watch a video. <laughs> Hopefully. So I'd like to say that it was by design that Marshmallow, Laser Feast, Rewind, Chagall, all people who were here uh, over the next couple of days were in that video, but it's entirely coincidental. Uh, but I, should, I thought we should probably own up to that. So the, the strap was about the UK being a place where creativity meets technology. And I think that's something that we're really interested to focus on and incredibly pertinent to this area of immersive technology. Uh, we've always believed that we're very good at creativity. Uh, in this space, I think we're able to bring together excellence in film, TV, games, theatre, art, uh, cultural engagement to start to think about this new form and how we, how 
we all work together because it's an incredibly collaborative industry across countries at the moment uh, to build a new industry around immersive technology. Uh, and the British government is very excited by that and excited by the possibility of using our skills in IP development and narrative to drive forward immersive tech in both entertainment and uh, in enterprise. Um, to do that, we're putting quite a lot of money into innovation and R&D. Uh, and there are a number of programs at the moment which are trying to put the kind of seed catalyst funding into the prototyping and the new, new product design and the new use case design which will become the forms which become part of this industry. Uh, there's one program which I'll mention which is called Audiences of the Future. And I think it's interesting because it's probably the first time that the British government has invested in content and invested in content which has to find an audience. So there are uh, four big uh, funding pots which have gone through that and they're looking at uh, esports or sports driven data. They're looking at performance. They're looking at how you take the, the assets of museums out into the world and how you use immersive technology and also how you use AR to create new entertainment uh, product. So we're, we're looking at how the government can be the catalyst for a new industry and keep the UK moving ahead of the market. So we, there was some uh, research done recently which said the UK was about 9% of the global immersive technology market uh, and so we want to keep being part of that. I think one of the reasons for that percentage is because it's a very international market. I've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks talking to big US studios um, who see the UK as a place which thinks differently about this stuff. And so we're very open and we're very open to working with international companies who want to come in and R&D in the UK. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm an advisor on the creative and digital team for the UK Department for International Trade. Uh, that's a UK department which exists to help international businesses expand and establish in the UK. It's there to support you in your thinking about the UK market and to help you with the kind of infrastructure of setting up. So I'm based in London. I have colleagues in Madrid. I'm hoping that one of my colleagues is here. Maybe it's not, uh, but I can introduce you to them. Also colleagues in Barcelona, if any of you have traveled here. So we're the part of the government that's really interested in you being part of our economy. And we're in an emerging marketplace where we're very, very interested in being porous. I think one of the, the exciting things that I've felt today working with everybody and talking to some of the companies is that there is this real sense that international collaboration can help us all move a market forward in a technology that we're all very excited by. So thank you very much for being here. I'm really uh, pleased that we're able to, um, to work with the British Council and with Telefonica on this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, pues, eh, para los que... well, for those of you, I see many of you with the headset, and there is simultaneous interpreting, the next presentation will be in English, so if uh, there's going to be half an hour with, for this presentation, perhaps it's too long or you want to understand everything, if you are uh, willing, don't be ashamed and go and fetch uh, headsets for simultaneous interpreting, if you like. Uh, there's no problem, uh, really, and it's really uh, very nice to listen to it in in Spanish. Uh, we have a whole team that are excellent. I don't know their names, but I always thank them for the great work that they do. Uh, it is not easy at all to translate uh, such an event. But I would like to take advantage of the opportunity to introduce Robin McNicholas. He, it is a luxury, an honor. He is co-founder and director of the Marshmallow Laser Fist uh, Studio. Um, uh, they are the leaders and creators of virtual reality right now. Uh, and we are lucky to have him here today, and I don't want to take any more time from his presentation, so I invite him to come to the stage and introduce whatever you like. You have the floor. And um, firstly, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm Robin. I'm representing um, the, the team that's predominantly based in London, Marshmallow Laser Feast, but we work internationally. And I'll, I'll talk over this. In terms of our areas of exploration, essentially what we've been doing, working with creative coders, working with uh, architects, designers, um, and people from all walks of life engaging with new technology in creative ways to essentially look for new narratives. We've worked with robotics, drones, and um, uh, lots of musicians' performances. 
Um, and as time's gone by, what we've realized is that there's a real, the, the line between the virtual world and the real world is completely blurred. And it just so happens that our community that we collaborate with are involved in CGI, um, but also in, in 3D fabrication as well. And what we've realized is that there's real opportunity to create new stories, new experiences for people. At the moment, it's uh, being called this experiential sector. Um, whether that sticks, I don't know, but my personal background was trained in film and television at the rise of the internet. And I think that that digital influence had a huge effect on me. It exposed lots of interest in branching narratives and things like that. And in my working life, I've worked in film and TV a little bit, but I've realized we've been trying as a team to pull things out of the screen and into the physical space. Um, we recently, in terms of sculpting with light, we recently made this. I don't know if we can turn these lights down just a little bit, but just to the point of um, collaboration, um, and what we found is our work finds itself more and more in, in these public spaces. This was an installation we did in, in London um, in January. And all the pipelines, all the, the ways in which we made it was using the same tools that we make VR with. But we, we brought it to, um, uh, to a location in London where we were able to incorporate the sound production and the, the visual production and, and allow it to manifest in the physical space for a shared experience for people. And we've realized that we can affect audiences in, in a totally different way um, that is very much different to how people engage with film and theater. Um, it's something new. And the, the great thing is it's, uh, we talk about it as though it's fresh snow. It, there's no set conventions. And so for someone who studied film and fantasizes about the idea of uh, creating um, filmic conventions. Imagine what it was like when film was first coming onto the scene and being put in the hands of creators to be able to edit, to be able to assemble and create stories in a, in a completely experimental way. And that's what we're trying to do uh, with all of this uh, new technology. But importantly, not just for technology's sake, we realize that essentially it's a, a commonly, um, it's a mantra that's used o across the board, uh, which is that the, the, the story has to be good. It doesn't matter about the technology. How we operate, essentially, we work a lot with the commercial world. Um, unlike a traditional artist, um, we do lots of, uh, lots of our income, uh, lots of the revenue streams, bootstraps, our IP and our, our our passion is to get our ideas into the world and what we've realized is that with the ideas our IP that we bring into the world we can exploit this uh, commercially as well in order to fuel that second horse and so it's a balance and there's lots of trust and it by no means is uh, a steady uh, set industry and so there's lots of creativity from the production um, that, that we have to rely on as well. But it's, um, it's just fascinating how, um, in how much we rely on uh, the creative producer to be able to uh, explore different funding channels and look at ways in which to uh, create new tools that are paid for, um, sometimes commercially and sometimes from funding bodies. And we work all over the place. Uh, we exhibit uh, work in galleries and museums and at events. Um, it, each job is different. <clears throat> I, I talk about this a lot in terms of the the age that we're in. It, it's for me. I'm, I'm interested in why we're making these these new stories with the technology. And um, we once showed a piece of. VR content to someone who took their headset off and said it was ironic that 
in order for them to focus, they have to put these goggles on in the age of distraction. And it, it, it never really left me in terms of um, the age that we're in. You know, we are constantly connected. And um, I think that we push against that a lot. We try and engage people and suspend disbelief and allow people to immerse themselves and, and stay in the stories that we want to create which I think theatre has done brilliantly and film and music and gaming does brilliantly but in terms of the use of technology in a multi-sensory context using all the senses gives you more engagement this, this is my opinion and so mixed reality this notion I, I just marvel at how as human beings we are so quick to make stories so quick to visually process even like playful gifts we draw meaning and the thing is we're loaded in terms of our senses we're totally loaded to take in all kinds of different stimuli and make meaning of it and, and we've been running with that a lot as well and asking this question where does reality begin and where does it end but there's a purpose behind what we've been doing as well in terms of our individual IP, we, we take inspiration from all kinds of places. And that before I came here, I was thinking, what was it that really inspired me the most um, uh, in recent months? And <laughs> this inspired me a great deal. And despite us as human beings being amazing um, and uh, like brilliantly capable of communicating super fast and um, reading stories in, into um, uh, animated GIFs. Just seeing this study recently of the biomass on the planet and seeing that, in fact, out of all the biomass here, the animal life uh, is this small section here, which is broken down even more, and human beings occupies this, this area here. And what we've realized is, geez, <laughs> we're nothing as well and uh, and there's so little time on this planet and there's so much to do and this is the predicament at MLF that we're constantly faced with and the environment has become part of our working uh, practice as well uh, through different prisms the work in is generally live in some way uh, there's sometimes a, a live event uh, that then it has parallel digital events, um, but each project manifests itself in a different way. But in terms of the experiential sector, there's lots of uh, discussions around the LBE or the location-based experience. And this is an area that we've been focusing on for some time, specifically when it comes to using virtual reality and AR now as well. And we've created lots of different uh, VR pieces. And uh, as you saw from the showreel, we, we did lots of um, live events and so on, but I'm going to focus the rest of this presentation on some of the um, processes that we've put in place for the uh, immersive works that we've created. Um, namely, a kind of deep dive into the natural world, which uh, started life as a project called In the Eyes of the Animal, which was commissioned for a festival where they just said, look, they, they didn't want VR, they just said, look, here's a forest, do something in that forest. And so it was a wonderful brief, and where we ended up was um, we liked the idea uh, of the contrast between bringing something high-tech into a very rural setting. And so in terms of In the Eyes of the Animal, it was a piece that was created that put people in the different sensory perspective of four different animals. Um, a mosquito, dragonfly, frog, and an owl that were eaten in succession um, and gave you the different uh, perspectives of them within the exact environment that we used a LiDAR scanner to, um, uh, to scan volumetric, um, the volumetric environment. But we also created a tool set, and this is, I, I don't know the expertise of uh, the people in this room, but we started using ar architectural tools for doing surveys and uh, uh, a LiDAR scanner just creates a point cloud of an environment. 
But then we worked with um, some really uh, incredible shader developers on um, uh, the digital end to allow us to manipulate the LiDAR data um, and animate it and inject life into it and, um, and, and inject color into it and ultimately carve a story with this quite sterile data. And I think it put us in a, uh, an interesting position because that meant um, that we were starting to think about VR in a volumetric context very early on. Um, we, and it led to Treehugger, which was the follow-up to that, essentially using the same tool set, but taking people um, on a journey into the canopy of a giant sequoia. And at the same time, we've been, and, and lots of the work at the moment in terms of XR has been um, displayed at film festivals. So Sundance and uh, South by Southwest and uh, Tribeca are, are very important platforms for us to share the work. But it's interesting to zoom out and, and observe that, in fact, there's a film festival going on. Uh, so it's music to my ears that there's an XR Fest going on because there needs to be more joined up venues and, and communities like this that allow the work to exist not in a film silo or a game silo or anything else, it's its own in, uh, individual space. And similarly with uh, regards to the connection between In the Eyes of the Animal and Tree Hugger, where we built tools that allows, allowed us to use LiDAR for a colossal wave and sweet dreams, we've been working in a games engine in, in Unity to um, essentially develop shaders and uh, allow the team to be diverse in terms of the tools that we use. The other project is VL or, or VVVV. <clears throat> um, in terms of syndication, we've realized there's so much effort and it's really expensive to create these, create VR experiences uh, when you're using volumetric capture and uh, especially LiDAR, there's lots of um, stitching and post uh, production to be done. And so, um, we need to be hardware agnostic. We can't rely on the just being one headset. We tailor it for that headset and that's it because as you've probably observed, the headsets get updated at a crazy speed. Um, and um, that means that we show the work in different contexts as well. So you make for VR, but then we port it to, like this was in Singapore on a cylindrical screen. This was a full dome in Mexico and this was a a museum in Bradford in the north of England. Um, and so the work can have a life beyond just it, the limitations of VR. And there's, a, there's an app for it, and there's also a, a website as well um, in terms of in the eyes of the, the animals, a case study. And I think it's important to approach um, just getting more more distance out of the energy put in. That's, that's essentially our strategy. It is by no means an easy route because a lot of the time for each uh, output, for each different screen, um, there's a lot of man hours required. But um, at least we're not um, just restricted to um, the archaeology of VR headsets. As I mentioned, the sense of touch is very important, and so physical interfaces are really important to us. Um, and so is the sense of smell. For Treehugger, we took the learnings of how audiences behaved with, in the eyes of the animal, and thought, how could we improve this? And so we developed a scent device and a scent track that deployed smell, smells of the forest, um, the forest floor, a kind of sapwood scent, and then the canopy. Um, that were deployed at, at various stages. Um, there's lots of mechatronic um, enthusiasts, lots of people working with Arduino and, and so on that we engage with to, to get our ideas into the world. Um, and we've realized that using sense is really divisive, um, although it's by no... The, the wonderful thing about human beings is we can, um, we can really gauge the uncanny valley. We can see if something is synthetic. And so when working with scent, it's incredible 
how sensitive and acute people's noses are, especially children who um, are even more sensitive. So there's learnings there in terms of, okay, well, these things need to be variable and personalized to each user as they experience the work, which is profoundly different and more expensive than film in that there's not just a catch-all. But if you can vary it in, in ways that's manageable, um, the, the, the results from that, from the audience, uh, are encouraging. And so tactile surfaces, shared experiences. For, for, if you imagine this was a kind of soft, oh, you can't see it on there. It's a soft, fuzzy felt that people could touch that resembled the shape of a, a giant sequoia. Um, slightly, and you could put your head inside the giant sequoia. Um, but the feeling of it, we spent a lot of time focused on what the sensation on the fingertips would be, and it has an impact on the story. If it was a cold marble, it would be a very different story. Um, and social contracts, building confidence for, uh, that allows people to explore and engage in the work without feeling self-conscious. Um, like, similar to this space, there's the Phi Center, there's various other entities emerging um, that are XR profile spaces. Definitely in Montreal, it's the Phi Center that have supported lots of uh, our peers and lots of uh, work in, in this area. Um, and we were lucky to show our first untethered experience there. And that was a big deal for us in terms of being able to detach wires for the VR headset and allow people to move around and for each other to see themselves in the virtual environment. Which leads on to Ocean of Air, which uh, you saw a snippet of earlier through Mark's presentation. But essentially, we've, again, as stepping stones, built from the volumetric capture of the in the eyes of the animal, developed shaders and techniques and ways in which to boost production values um, in, in tree hugger to then bring a, um, a, a turnkey experience. So um, uh, what I mean by that is an experience that uh, we can present to a, an audience um, and allow them to run day in, day out. And, and what we did in a gallery in London called the Saatchi Gallery was um, present a 12-person experience. Initially, it was presented for six weeks. Uh, but it, because we were able to, um, it sold out. And so we were able to extend it for six months. So it's a very positive um, story for the VR scene. And the learnings from the audience, it was just really compelling in that the, the audience was so varied. There were families, there were, um, there were students, there were uh, tourists, lots of people interested in tech, but lots of people in interested in fine art and so it was a very useful way of being able to refine the experience um, and kind of in, in kind of on the fly evolve the experience to make it as good as possible and as robust as possible um, uh, for constant use and of course as the technology improves uh, this is now touring and we're able to increase the capacity. At, at this point in time, we had two 10 meter by eight meter. Uh, th that was the gallery space, side by side. Um, but we were able to um, have 12 people at a time. And the opening hours meant that we'd get about 240 people a day through. And they were all paying customers. They paid 20 pounds. Um, and we, uh, I think there was around 28,000 people came to it in the end um, over the six months. And it, may, it means that we can have conversations with galleries, different venues, and offer up viable ticketed solutions and say, look, you, you take a revenue share. This, this can operate on a business level as well. And uh, this is an important um, factor because for our scene, the XR scene, it, the, we need these sound business models to, to allow these experiences to thrive. Um, so what goes on in, we live in an ocean of air? Well, there's these tiers of immersion. We've put a lot of effort into just giving people confidence, making sure they're comfortable. Um, if they're a VR expert, 
well, they don't need much time, but they still need to be put in the right mindset. Similarly, if they've never tried anything like this, we need to train our staff so they can prep and, and um, allow um, a newbie, uh, someone that's completely fresh to, to VR, to engage confidently in a, in a space where they're essentially blindfolded and walking around with their hands being tracked. Um, as I mentioned, we had scent devices up top that were the scent track. The audio was um, bioacoustics recorded from the giant sequoia. Um, the video screens that you see there, um, they were interactive as well. So as people breathed, we could see people's breath. And as they interacted with their breath, when they exhaled carbon dioxide, um, you'd see those interactions to some degree on, on the projection screens as well. And this was really important for us because if you go to a gallery and imagine that it's just a black wall behind people in VR, it tells a very different story to having a live video counterpart. And for us, we've, we've really spent time thinking about that experience and thinking about how we engage people in, in different tiers of storytelling. I think this is a video uh, that just, what happens was people six at a time put the VR back, backs on, the headsets on, and we made a custom um, breath sensor that you can see dangling down there. And each of the individuals uh, are represented by their vascular system. And they wear a heart rate monitor, and effectively as they exhale, the CO2 is absorbed in, in, into, the, um, into the vegetation around and people are taken on a journey into the canopy of the giant sequoia, much like tree hugger. But I think these are just videos of, of the actual heart rate monitors and things like that. But that means there's an incredible amount of data as well and we, we made sure that people's privacy was respected, that the data, the heart rate monitor data for example, was um, anonymous, but it's fascinating being able to harvest user experiences as well and learn from that to, to work out where in a timeline are people's hearts um, racing, how do we improve the work, how do we use this data to, to refine the work. Um, these are the visitor numbers that I mentioned earlier. And this was the first time, really, that we were genuinely marketing independently for ourselves. Uh, we were working with traditional press, but it was extraordinary how much social media helped us. And so engaging with influencers, uh, that much to my dismay, because I'm not a fan of the influencer scene, but it was extraordinary just realizing that uh, how we actually managed to sell tickets, and it was extraordinary how powerful social media was there. Tyra Banks rocked up, and there was a, an extraordinary amount of, um, uh, of activity online as well, which helps build the case and build interest as well, and spread the word. Um, Gender-wise, it was split 50% male, 45% female, and 5% of people that visited preferred uh, were, were non-binary and what was interesting was um, this was encouraging we weren't just getting the traditional male tech geeks in there and importantly what what we did on a technical level in the background was we refined this turnkey system this like robust system that worked technically and had a kind of pit stop team if if hardware went down we had hot swappable hardware to be replaced and all the rest of it. And um, it's, again, improving all the time, uh, but by no means uh, easy at the moment. It's much easier to put a projector on and play hundreds of people a movie. But that's not the point. We're, we're really about immersion and multisensory. So we repurposed the technology that we refined for a very different piece. So same backpacks, same hand tracking, which was just a leap motion um, with um, some trackers on the wrists. 
We also tracked people's feet to create a dining VR experience working the, with the British Film Institute. And the idea started with exploring how people's perception of taste totally changes when your visual stimuli alters and the sonic aspects alter as well. Um, there's incredible research into the, the human perception of flavor. So if the same food that is served on a, a, sh a plate shaped in a booba shape, like a cloud, um, is perceived totally different. The same food, if it's served on a spiky, kiki plate, is perceived as acidic. And how do we bring that phenomenon into a three-dimensional sp space? Um, and how do we bring, what, what does a spiky sound make? What does booba sound like? And in parallel, we were doing a research project, which was trying to solve a problem that we've been faced with, which is where lots of people in VR, they're waving their hands around and in, engaging with uh, the virtual in, imagined space. And there's some interesting things to be had there, but we want to bring props into the environment. We want tactility, physical interfaces. We want to push against the way that we're conditioned to interact with glass screens, metallic hard surfaces, clicking mice. Tech These days, we can have squidgy stuff, we can have more real world stuff and help blur the line between the virtual and the real again and start making um, new stories with that tech. It's got larger implications. So when we, when we were asking the question, can we, uh, can we track um, candy floss? I failed to mention we have a PhD student that's two years into researching just that. Um, and the further implications of it, we've been using machine learning to essentially create predictive motion models of how things squidge and how things unsquidge, um, which is exciting, but very difficult. Um, and the reason why we're doing it is essentially to um, fill in some of the gaps, the touch, sight, sound, taste, all play part in, in, in immersion. And with a tool set that lets us interact with deformable objects, well, this just means that we can bring puppets into VR. We can bring, um, we can use and exploit uh, the technology to create surgical VR simulations with actual tactile prosthetics. It goes beyond the playful candy floss. You know, there's plausible ways to apply deformable objects across the board. Um, but the way that we've been expressing it is through Sweet Dreams. And Sweet Dreams, we took it to Sundance in January. And this year, we're fundraising for it. We created a taster, a 15-minute experience um, that people rock up. At Sundance, two people at a time uh, rocked up and... Um, the first room was just a pink room. They took their shoes off, they took their bags and coats off, put a VR backpack on and a headset, and then they met an actor. Um, and this actor was a shaman <laughs> and a clown, and her job essentially was to be a character in, in, in the world that we created and to create a social contract to encourage people to confidently engage in the experience without worrying about the fact they're just about to eat and drink in virtual reality, but with actual food. Um, and that was a critical part, contextualizing it and just holding people's hands. We designed um, multiple immersive rooms that people um, went through with kinetic set and so we had a, a straw that when you sucked it, the walls closed in. And that was just a weighing scale that was sending a float value to unity. Uh, it was a hibiscus tea. We had a um, popping candy. Um, oh, oh this, this was the actor. So slightly nervous at first, the actor essentially burst through in, uh, and essentially created a bond and reassured people and held their hand and said, look, it's going to be okay. Now, the floor we created was squidgy. 
And so for each uh, footprint, they made the, a ripple uh, made in space. And this was a way of seeing each other in, in VR, but also to slow audiences down. The story world that we created was called Luscious Delicious Land. This is the entrance where you suck on the drink and, and you're taken in into the world. And when you're in the world, various dishes, deformable objects, present themselves. Pig from far away, ground unicorn horn, all of which were kind of in unity. We made them as flex objects that if you reached out and touched them, they would wobble like jelly. Um, and various kind of particle simulations as well. When people ate a rice paper popping candy, um, it tasted of violet sherbet. Uh, we, we triggered these um, particles all around. And the piece culminated in drinking the sun out of the universe. So we liked the idea of playing with scale. And by drinking uh, the sun, again, it was just an electronic weighing scale. It meant that um, it would reduce in size, and boom, everything went black. And it's these kind of things, these kind of, essentially they were multi sensory pairings, they were flavored pairings, that it wasn't like you rocked up and you took to a serviette in and you, and you ate a VR meal. We were using taste to facilitate the story. And this is just the, um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of taster storyboard. Um, and we created all these different dishes with the idea that each dish, you know, maybe seven people in the room would have the lobster and ten people in the room would have the pig, but a whole bunch would have the unicorn. And we could essentially create branching narratives, different rooms, different dishes, and essentially create a modular XR experience that uh, people were able to engage with, but people were able to revisit. And that's ho hopefully what we're going to uh, release next year. There's just a few. These are just a few of the um, creatures, and this is all real time as well. So there's lots of like positive progression there. I realise I have very little time left. Um, but again, for me, this is uh, a aesthetics that's very much like in the computer games aesthetic, uh, because we're using a games engine to create it, but we're starting to borrow from the motion graphics aesthetics as well, uh, which I really like. To close off, um, we're very fortunate to be working with one of the audience of the future projects. Um, and it's this creative cluster that um, can, it's the performance cluster. And so Sweet Dreams is being facilitated um, in terms of the research by this audience of the Future Fund. It's a collaboration with Punch Drunk, who do lots of immersive theatre work, and the Royal Shakespeare Company, as well as the Philharmonia Orchestra, Magic Leap and Intel, Epic Games, uh, the Phi Center, um, and various research institutions. And this, what this is doing is essentially allowing us to make tools that we then share and help just try and carve our own space in the XR sector. And I'm really up for chatting. Um, uh, if, if you're interested, our um, Twitter is uh, MarshmallowLF, and our Instagram is MarshmallowLaserFeast. But thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to uh, the rest of the festival. Maybe, maybe we have little time for maybe one ah, question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the question, of course, por supuesto, después de... Of course, after the round table that is about to come is over, you can talk to him and ask him, but well, maybe just one question. Does anybody want to ask a question? Yes, here. Is there a, is there a mic? Hi. Um, are you exploring anything related with reactive content in the studio? Reactive content? Yeah. Content that is being adapted. Yeah, like definitely. In terms of um, kind of li like living, lots of our uh, explorations are working with open frameworks and uh, the creative code scene. And so uh, lots of the material is, is generative. Um, at the moment, in terms of uh, 
actual living digital projects that are kind of machine learning based, we have lots of ML training going on that I'd say is um, reactive um, in the, um, but actually it's more statistical based more than anything else. Um, in, in answer, like, all of our work is interactive uh, in that way. Um, it's just that, uh, yeah, so, so in terms of reactive, if it's like data viz and so on, um, we do do uh, explorations in, into that, but it's not our primary focus. Pues muchas gracias. Yo creo que como el diálogo continúa la conversación. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I talk to you, so yeah, yeah. You will be around. So yeah, absolutely, and, and thanks again. Muchas gracias. Cheers. So, as they uh, set the stage, I'll invite to the stage Emilio Blanque. The Spain Country Manager, Innovation Consultant Division, Veronica Rodriguez, Content Manager at Itobari, Creator of uh, Woman in XR, Roberto Romero, Founder of uh, Greiner School Company and Founder of uh, Lighthouse, Javier Antinas Garcia, Leader of Innovative Proposals at uh, Devices for Telefonica. So, wow, what a round table. It's a great honor to have you all here. And for those of you who already know us, and uh, for those of you that uh, don't know them, here in Spain, we, uh, well, luckily, we have uh, professionals that uh, um, are, that make the great with any other country, with companies that are being innovative, companies that are and developing very important topics all around the place. And sometimes it's difficult to acknowledge that we are doing things really good. And this roundtable, for you to know, who they are, we will get started. I'll try to open it up to the public, to the audience, sorry. But in order to have a first uh, round, uh, we could start by Emilio. So maybe we can have a first round to introduce yourselves and tell the rest of the audience what you do, who you are, etc. Okay, so thank you very much, Oscar. I'm Emilio from Vision. Vision is a company that we consider as a service and innovation company. We are 70 people working at everything that has to do with XR. We are developing uh, projects, uh, many projects uh, out of here, I have to say. One of the things that we have a lack of, and after seeing the, the presentation by Marshmallow, I think that it's a little bit of, uh, I'm a little bit of, uh, a little bit jealous, if you want, positively jealous, but companies are not investing in these projects, but I think that we have a great amount of talent in order to develop this type of things. And um, we are basically working at different verticals. The, the one that we like the most is narrative, but obviously sometimes uh, we, we, we can't live just with that. So um, we are developing things related to healthcare, education, training, learning, and uh, things that have to do with uh, contents for brands and ads. And luckily, we have among our customers um, Google and NASA, even NASA. We are developing projects for Apple or for Samsung or Huawei. We are involved in 5G projects because we think that 5G will revolution VR uh, and all these are real-time content, especially for streaming events and sports and things like that. And we are uh, making, we're highlighting everything that has to do with uh, XR zones. This is what we believe that will be the uh, esports in the future, trying to um, make the users get involved, to be integrated in the experience. We're trying to lead the. Um, well, within the events that are being uh, developed uh, at a national scale, like Gamergy this last week, or uh, Barcelona Games World, or Brain Hug, etc. But as you can see, we touch many uh, topics, but we are seven something people, and uh, we have uh, biomedical engineers in our staff, and we have creative people or developers in Unity and Real or classic programming. So. Everything that has to do with a 360 video will, will touch almost everything, basically. So, thank you. Veronica, it's your turn. 
Well, my background is not um, impressive, but well, I come from a more academic uh, um, background. I'm sp specialized in storytelling and branded content until Nicolas Alcala uh, put me uh, VR Googles and next year I was studying uh, VR and augmented reality production in 2016 and since then I haven't done anything but trying to figure out what this means is about, how narrative work I wrote about that on my blog, and thanks to your first uh, opportunity by No Arses, I was creating the ISO World uh, Madrid community, where we hold um, events with the idea of spreading these technologies, how they work, the professionals that work uh, there, and we need to m make people aware of everything that we are doing in Spain and all over the world in order to get people involved. And uh, we were also... In Oasis, we were launching an initiative that was seeking for giving visibility to um, professional profiles, and specifically women. What women uh, were uh, developing VR, or at marketing level, or at production level, because there are many profiles. And we need to make these profiles uh, be known by, by people, so this is what I'm doing right now. Okay, Roberto. Good afternoon, thank you very much for the invitation, Oscar. Thanks for to update uh, Telefonica British Council. It's always a pleasure to be here talking to so many interesting people. I'm Roberto Romero. I've been working uh, um, as content creator for 20 years, especially digital content, video games, uh, cinema uh, advertisement. I have a Switch Lighthouse, com Switch Lighthouse company. Here we have part of the of the stuff. We develop contents, uh, entertainment contents for the audience, but at a very early stage of the market. And well, basically one year ago, I closed Future Life uh, House, uh, started a new adventure that is called Grace Call Company. It's a video games um, study. It's a brand that I share with other four companies. It's called Victor Voyagers, and we develop B2B content, B2C uh, video games, and we do things that have to do with education, entertainment for marketing. We also develop things for the, for different industries. Well, it's quite quite different, quite varied. We have published, in my case, I've um, participated at um, different VR productions, uh, content uh, customers like Sony Digital Domain, uh, Disney, Facebook. We are uh, partners, we are Facebook partners, and the truth is that Spain is the the market that we have but uh, we are really happy so well I'll elaborate on that later on thank you so it's your turn Javier okay so thank you very much thank you Oscar and thanks to Espacio Telefonica and uh, British Council the opportunity of inviting us and all the, the the brave guys and girls that have come along with this hot so, well, I'm Javier Antinas, I work at Telefonica, I work, I work at the global part of Telefonica, and I work at the device um, area. So this is a little bit weird, but basically what we do is uh, to try to catch all the innovation and uh, all that we see as uh, something new in the market, and we try to land a commercial proposal in every country where Telefonica is present. And we started three years ago with everything that has to do with VR. So basically, we started with devices. This is what this was our natural area, and we started to deconstruct everything that had to be with uh, had to do sorry with uh, VR end to end. We saw that device was useless without content, so we started to create content in a compulsive way. And thanks to Samsung, we started to play at home with uh, difference that have to do with sponsorship, Movistar Plus, because luckily in Telefonica we have uh, many things that we can play with. And uh, at the same time, we saw that there were content platforms that we have to talk to too. There were operational systems, we had Barry Oculus, we had Google doing some things. So, in the end, we have tried to create a 360 proposal. And now we see that it's a little bit um, under development, but we will be able to make it uh, at the end of the day with uh, technology uh, and content from Telefonica. Thanks, Javier. You've uh, introduced the great question. 
that we are here to ask. This is about new narratives. So you all have in common that you relate to contents in a way or another one or another way. And at this first round, I would like to know your approach about this obvious topic in terms that every new language or content needs a new narrative. A new manner, but I don't know from your approach, uh, from your experience, I don't know if you're able to speak about what challenges are ahead of us, what, um, how you tackle all this that at a first sight could seem like obvious, but in real terms it seems that uh, it's not well understood sometimes. Well, at production level, I'm not 100% involved in a creativity or na narrative. I've seen during the six years that I've been at the company that at the beginning it was uh, um, when we it was try um, we tried and we made mistakes and we saw how we were creating a narrative piece and I think that we've been able to accomplish uh, good know-how we've learned a lot and the problem now when we think of uh, some film production or the, bri the big publishing companies could get into developing this type of things it's the figure of the consultant of uh, immersive narratives because many important, uh, many important directors that want to develop big pieces find uh, problems that we've tackled before and they have not even thought about them. So this will be a little bit complex in order to put all this together. But we have to think that um, cinema as we know it today, maybe I think it took, up, uh, took, um, th it took 30 years to define its own narrative. That is the one that we're living today. So VR uh, are starting to tell stories, uh, well, it has, been, it has been doing so for six or seven years, and this is at the stage that everything is still to be done and defined. At Vision, do you have any specific profile in terms of specialty? Is it a shared profile? It's just for curiosity. Well, at Vision, we have a creative team, and we saw that at the beginning, Seven or six or seven years ago, as we came from the digital marketing agency, the normal thing was to give advice to the agencies that, that were starting to develop different things, and they came along with creative proposals. The problem was that the creative person, as such as he doesn't know the means, he doesn't know the technology, creativity, generally speaking, doesn't make much sense. So, with time, we decided to create a um, creative team that was not very important at the beginning because they had a lack of uh, technical knowledge but as time has gone by they have acquired that knowledge and now we have a very solid creative team that supports uh, creative uh, stuff from the agencies or the brand so that the project makes a sense because otherwise it would be it would be really complicated okay veronica so what about your approach well i think as uh, emily that we are facing a new paradigm because it's curious never ever we had faced such a means that has had a direct impact on final users we used to test different levels with uh, social agents that validated it and published some standards until the rest of the world received it so to speak and now at this um, at this amazing time we are uh, testing technologies that are starting, that are still being developed. So we are uh, participating there. We are experiencing many things in a very beautiful and chaotic way. So it's true that we have many cross languages. So it's, it, of course, it's, it's very normal that we are using previous, um, previous uh, means. It's normal that we've lived a uh, very beginning where we had 360 videos where we only had to look at a 360 space, but we are evolving towards a narrative or formats that understand the VR potential in order to become a new means because there's a general opinion, although it's arguable, of course, that really says that VR is a technology, it's a platform, it's not still a means. And I think that it's going towards uh, that. Um, um, that uh, goal, it has a great narrative potential, otherwise I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that. But we need to know how it works, we need to know how it develops, so this is why we consider 
we still consider it as a platform, as Murray used to say, but I think that we are starting to understand that there is an interaction, the fact of putting the user or the, uh, the audience in a space to uh, convey that capability of interacting with this environment, it, it's what, it would make this magic beyond empathy and to put into other people's feet. So I think that this, we can see what, uh, what is to be in that environment to interact with people? Um, we are moving toward reactive narratives, etc. But well, we are walking that path, and we are, have still a lot to do. We've been working with this for six or seven years, so more or less. So this has to be developed. And the good thing is that many people from many uh, different profiles are working with that. And this chaotic, but it's marvelous at the same time. You're, you're, um I'm going to uh, change uh, my discourse. It is true that we are in a new in new times. We have new devices coming to the market uh, for six or seven years. But virtual reality is not new, and it is not a technology in itself. It's a way to tell content. We could. Uh, um, summarize it with immersive content. I prefer that to virtual reality. But uh, before, we, I would like to put some order. Mark has uh, spoken about investing in content. That's uh, extremely important for the industry. Content, in the end, is what defines everything. Uh, in the end, and if we uh, just look behind uh, virtual reality, we are talking about immersive and rea reactive uh, uh, content, and we have to look at the video games because they have been developing that for 20 or 30 years at the international level, and that's the source of all narratives that we are now using in VR with some nuances, of course, but v VR uses tools, yeah, and theater as well, theater. Uh, yeah, I was going to say because Robin mentioned two things that I like very much. Uh, Punch Rank, uh, that is an immersive uh, theater company that I loved, and and I had to uh, leave a job in order to uh, delve deeper into that. Uh, uh, that's what thanks to that company. We've been in the video game industry and developing those uh, tools for a long time. Many people came from the film uh, world and they were not close to the interactive uh, um, scene and they are dis rediscovering these uh, technologies. Uh, people from the video games uh, sector are much more familiar with that. Uh, ways to create, to recreate uh, reality virtually. The definition of virtual reality um, from the 1990s is the one that we keep using now. And I see some uh, someone who has been in this sector for a long time, and I, I'm sure that they agree with me. But this is important to understand the market. And in order to understand the market, we have to understand generational changes. We are now designing content for the future generations in order to consume content in the next decade or two decades. Uh, because if someone is able to see uh, someone who is uh, under the 18 years of age, and you cannot imagine them seeing just one screen at the same time. They are looking at several screens at the same time. They have attention deficit because they are used to a lot of stimuli coming to them and we have to uh, respond to that from the industry, from the entertainment industry and content generation industry. We have to tackle that attention deficit. We need to um, create an immersive um, uh, experience and we have to give them tools in order to be able to manage uh, that reality they are experiencing. I have to leave Indiana Jones instead of going to uh, watch the film. And that's what we have been doing in the video game industry in, uh, in graphic adventures where I become part of the experience. And from then on, we will understand that the market uh, uh, has many branches. Immersive media cover demands in uh, education industry in any uh, uh, area of life. One of the last projects I developed is a video game for PlayStation 4 for tourism. Uh, for tourism, for a tourism uh, uh, office in Catalonia. They said that we need the metrics to uh, grow so that people come to Catalonia but not to the capital. And I said, what profile of, uh, what uh, age range you want? People be under 35. And I said, oh, a graphic uh, adventure that talks about the, the legend, about 
the history, but that takes us to those um, places, but in an immersive, um, uh, immersive experience. Uh, they have been downloaded 200,000 uh, times in, in a few months, and they are starting to grow, and it's uh, been successful, and they are diversifying in tourism in terms of access to the different web pages of the different regions and in travel uh, them itself. So we have to understand this sector as someone that, something that covers really many different uh, areas, and we are just scrapping the surface of it, uh, tele uh, working from home and other markets. Uh, I, I, I talk about immersive media because we are not talking about VR, also AR. Um, 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 there are so many um, um, R's, uh, something reality. Uh, that's something that we are all going to have on a daily basis. That's a tool that will uh, favor production, productiveness. It is going to enable uh, home working and it will allow us to have more leisure time. Uh, we are always looking for things to, to be, uh, to not to be a slaves of, of work, uh, but to really be able to enjoy. And we all love entertainment and I guess that m most of you will love entertainment, and this is excellent to develop this environment. But I'm going to uh, shut up because I'm taking too much time. Javier, do you want to add something to that? No. I, I fully agree with what the, the three of them have said. I think that narratives uh, are very much influenced by the way uh, in which we consume content. Content, mm, right now, the way in which we consume content, normally for VR it's through uh, Google's uh, glasses, uh, uh, you just isolate yourself socially and those are things that we will have to work on in order to improve them. We have to find a way to, to turn it into a more social experience. Uh, but I, I'm sure that that is going to, um, uh, to uh, that has come to stay. And I love what Robin said because I always believed, uh, virtual reality, I always believed that uh, uh, it's good that it is immersive, that you can really travel somewhere, that you can uh, leave experiences from your uh, 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 from from your uh, uh, house, from your home. So the more you deceive uh, your senses, the more uh, immersive the experience will be. That's what I mean. And those types of experiences where you can be uh, in a backstage of a concert that uh, has been months uh, um, uh, uh, sold out, um, uh, uh, that you can experience the uh, final game of the Champions League, for example, um, uh, even if you are not there, I think that turns things into a very different thing. Instead of being an, uh, a, a, no, a part of the audience, you are part of the, uh, uh, of the performance itself, and you can leave it or experience it as if it was real and you were participating there. So the impact of that technology and the impact of those types of technologies also augmented reality. One year ago, we were here speaking about education, the impact of VR on education. It's exactly the same. It has nothing to do how we went to school and how the, we studied the history of uh, Egypt or classical Greece uh, compared to how they can see it right now with uh, augmented reality in a tablet or uh, VR glasses. Um, uh, and that changes how we are going to tell everything. These people here are experts in in training, com, uh, enter, enterprise training and creating experiences for companies that uh, take you to uh, an oil rig, uh, offshore uh, oil platform, and you can study everything as if you were there. And that is the magic of uh, these types of technologies, and I think that's what we have to push forward from the narrative part so that that image uh, that becomes a reality and crystallizes, uh, materializes. So after this second cycle, I guess that there will be lots of people who will have questions that will be much more interesting than mine because I'm not very original. But I just I would like to f uh, uh, cl close my uh, my um, uh, question uh, my questioning uh, part with a few questions. A vision uh, was acquired by one of the references in the creation of content in this country, which is Media Pro, and I think that it is very interesting when we talk about neo-narratives, and I know that it is early and it is difficult, 
But how do you think? Uh, from my ignorance, I understand that something as Media Pro understands that you are there to help them to access those new audiences, to help them understand those new narratives. How do you see that coexistence between the more traditional uh, world of content and this new world that is starting to emerge? I think that it would be a good time to just uh, uh, answer something uh, that does not answer your, your, your question. But anyway, I'll try to answer. Uh, we uh, have been uh, uh, with them for, for a short time, so I cannot tell you much. But we are there to just help them to create new content, to really uh, give them another approach. They have a, around 160 uh, series in production for the different platforms, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Movistar, uh, Netflix, uh, HBO, and everything. And what we would like to achieve is that each and every one of those productions will have an, a part which is immersive, and that can be supported, for example, for the launch of the campaign in the uh, 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 outlets, uh, so that you can create social experiences and all sorts of experiences. And we believe that that's what we we are there for, and also to uh, contribute some innovation and innovative ideas. That's more or less our target, and that our motto is always looking beyond. We all want to be two heads, two years ahead of our competition in everything. Um, also with eSports, they are very powerful there. Um, uh, in that platform, and we believe uh, very much in trying to foster that, and we are going to be uh, to insist a lot on uh, doing that and to try to bring uh, or channel innovation through our company. And then when I get to Barcelona, my boss uh, tells me that I got into a trouble. But anyway, that's um, that's uh, the idea. We will invite you in one year, and you tell us uh, how things have developed. Okay. Veronica, yesterday we uh, heard data that were given to us about the study that is uh, done in the UK and in the US about how um, there is a, a gender gap that is uh, growing uh, in terms of uh, everything that has to do with XR. And people wonder whether that is a failure uh, on the part of content or it is a problem of narrative or is a cultural uh, thing that has to do with devices. Because there are lots of differences uh, among people, not only that develop, but also that consume. There are more men or males that uh, consume this media compared to women. I don't know. Uh, you are a creative uh, person and you have a, a special sensitivity for this topic. I don't know if you can shed some light on this because when we look at those figures, it is really amazing and surprising because they are growing, not decreasing. Yeah, being honest, I think that it is a problem with video games. As Roberto said, it, uh, virtual reality has a lot to do with video games and probably m m most of the data that we have about how many people have uh, VR uh, uh, Googles and how many people are consuming VR, I think that culturally, that's a world that has always been more appealing for for guys. And uh, this has been several years uh, underway, but of course there has been a growth in terms of te technological communities that supported me uh, females. And, and it is true that and, uh, it is a complex topic that we of course have to tackle. And it seems that uh, it is a gender question, but perhaps it is not so much as Catherine was saying, the idea of reaching a representative uh, audience uh, or an audience that is representative of society has to include women. So who could uh, better do that than a, a woman or a, a kid or an elderly person uh, so, uh, uh, so that they can create something that really uh, appeals to everyone. Some people say that women are more uh, intuitive and not so much uh, logical. I'm not very logical. Uh, I uh, get carried away very easily. But of course, that's my personal sensitivity. I don't think it is something, something exclusive to women. The person that wants to tell a story shouldn't uh, think about what uh, 
um, what uh, about the story they want to tell or uh, what they want to do, but uh, who is listening to them? But there are new genres now emerging, and we have the Pride uh, Parade here in Madrid, and we are talking about transformation, and all those topics, are, of course, have to be addressed at um, some point. Uh, I think it is necessary to have m uh, more initiatives that include different points of view, but not so much focusing on the point of view of women. I don't want to see experience for a set of women that have been perhaps uh, raped or or has, uh, uh, ha harassed. Um, I, I just want to uh, be exactly in the same places that women are. Um, just include their point of view without necessarily focusing on uh, on the fact that they are women. Uh, to include that's something which is completely normal. Okay, great, Roberto. In the talk. Uh, in Robin's talk, uh, you spoke about uh, the, he spoke about a topic that uh, um, uh, uh, I think any of you can answer this question. But perhaps in your case, you have had a long experience in these last years working with brands as a service and also with your own content, uh, with what he called the adaptive content. That content that uh, uh, many people call it 360, but uh, it is perhaps confusing. I'll try to explain it. When you do something, for example, for uh, ca uh, Catalonia tourism, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, idea that everything has to be adaptable to anything. No, we need adaptation to everything. Um, uh, we don't uh, necessarily uh, have to create things that uh, appeal to or that can be used in every channel. Uh, how, what do you think about that? Is that a limitation for the work you do? Is, there, is it a challenge? Do you create content specifically for a channel? Or No, normally that is uh, set by the budget. When a brand hires you to launch a campaign, you propose content content and you can have a set of solutions, but if budget uh, does not uh uh, allow you to do that, uh, you will have to do things differently. For example, in the Catalonia Tourism Project, we had different types of content for mobile, VR, for uh, PlayStation, for screens, we have a different content. The Instagram experiences are different. Content is adapted. Everything starts from the, from the same art, from the same 3Ds, and from the same philosophy for the whole campaign. But every piece of content is created and designed specifically for a channel. But there are other campaigns where we could not create different content. The same content that you do interactively for uh, uh, VR uh, Googles, you can uh, pre-render it in a, in a virtual reality environment or for a screen or something, and perhaps it makes not so much sense because not all devices are appropriate or have the same set of tools. Uh, to tell stories, you have to adapt it, but of course, uh, uh, budget also is a constraint. And uh, depending on the, br the uh, in brands, uh, normally tend to reuse content a lot because you are creating something that, if you um, uh, shape it properly, it can serve uh, lots of purposes, and you can do so lots of things with that. And you can have. Lo I don't know if that was your question, more or less. Yeah, uh, I, uh, yeah, that is what I was asking you. Uh, uh, yeah, it is a question of budget. If you have budget, you can do it. Um, you can adapt content to different channels, and you don't need to reuse. And uh, otherwise, you have to reuse because when we talk about XR as an umbrella, I understand that according to your experience, uh, content for VR has nothing to do with AR and with uh, XR and everything. Of course, it is completely different. Uh, lately, I'm a game designer uh, in Virtual High House. I was a technology manager, uh, but I also got uh, into everything because I am uh, very cur curious. But I'm now m much more focused on game design, and you have those tools, of course, uh, at hand in order to be able to adapt all that content to the platform that, that you have to work with. It is the use of those assets and the use of that language that makes you different and to makes you uh, makes every um, a platform uh, shine, so to speak. Uh, it depends on whether it is a mobile phone. The surface changes you know, in a mobile phone. That's a frame. Um, you can break the frame when you go from film to representing something in a virtual reality experience. But of course, when the size of the screen is different, uh, that has to also also has to be adapted. And they do that in, for example, in the 
uh, uh, airplanes. Airplanes. Uh, when I visit a customer, they ask for a virtual reality, and I always say, "No, you want to tell a story, uh, and you tell me what the story you want to tell, and I tell you what is the best way to tell that story." That's what we should do in the industry. We shouldn't be selling uh, virtual reality. We have to uh, tell stories, and we have to choose the best uh, media for that. Uh, it can be, uh, uh, if it's education, we have to go for the most efficient tools for education. And if it's uh, or that save money, that reduce problems, if it's training, for example, that reduce uh, uh, work accidents, every industry has its own goals and immersive media uh, help achieve those objectives, those goals. But it has to be a means, not a, a goal in itself. That's my answer. I don't know if I have answered your question. Javier, just to finish off this, for this round, uh, Emilio was saying that one of the big challenges in terms of content and new capabilities is going to be 5G. You are at the core of that industry. What can you tell us about that? Yes, the truth is that one of the use cases, very clear use cases that we see for 5G is everything that has to do with VR. Uh, VR, I don't know to what extent, uh, uh, 360 video, uh, but anyway, in that uh, uh, the bandwidth, uh, the speed, the latency reduction, uh, the capacity that you are going to have to uh, to transfer information, 8K video, um, anything. With Emilio uh, 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 records um, uh, a, a, a football, a soccer game with Media Pro, you should be able to transfer it uh, to a mobile phone or to a, a VR uh, Google's or uh, anywhere. That's one of the things that uh, 5G is going to bring with it. It is one of the things that we expect, at least from technology. It is true that it is just, just uh, the beginning, the 5G. We are starting to see use cases. For me, VR is a very clear use case. Augmented reality is exactly the same. We have seen what Google announced recently about the integration of Google Maps with uh, augmented reality and everything and the possibility to uh, go uh, uh, through the street uh, with uh, Google glasses and, and uh, to tell you that uh, whether there is a, a re you can make a reservation in a specific restaurant, whether your favorite dish is uh, available, whether uh, there is a promotion that day, and new ways of interacting with your customer for advertising, or you go through, uh, uh, by, uh, you pass by, and there's a, star a Starbucks, and they suggest you an offer if you come in at that point in time. And that volume of data that we will have to process and to give back to the customer in real time so that there is no uh, latency and you are just uh, 100 meters away from a Starbucks and that's what 5G will give us, I guess. And uh, extended reality is one of the clear use cases of 5G. Um, uh, new ca use cases uh, are emerging every day. Uh, there are just a few for the time being, but I'm sure that the technology still has to um, uh, develop a lot more in order to be able to cater for the uh, demands that are coming. Uh, and Movistar, regarding 5G, what is uh, what is uh, Movistar doing? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't work with, with the networks. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be in one year or in, in more time, but of course we are working with 5G, we will have a 5G experience, we will start by, uh, cho uh, by choosing Europe and, and LATAM will come a little bit later, Germany, UK and Spain of course will be the focus for the deployment of 5G for Telefonica, but anyway I cannot tell you much because we are we're doing lots of things in edge computing, what they call 4.9, 4.5 because we see that the elasticity of the network is, uh, should you call it, call it 4X? Uh, you can give it uh, whatever name you like. Uh, you can give it what, whatever name or whatever figure for, to that X, but Movistar Telefonica will have a 5G proposal. That's for sure. Okay, so it's a perfect occasion to open up the conversation to the uh, audience. Uh, I could uh, go on asking, but there are uh, people raising, raising their hands. So there's a question and there at the back. Hola. Hello. Thank you very much because it's been a really interesting chat. There's something uh, where I would like to, to focus on. You are 
Speaking about entertainment, this is one of the big markets that this technology could have. But I don't know if maybe it is because what I'm uh, studying, it's a mix between uh, journalism and uh, audiovisual communication. I was wondering how can develop everything that has to do with AR, with all these contents that, ha that are audiovisual contents that but are highly immersive. I mean, let me explain myself. I guess that you have some point of view regarding how to mix information and augmented reality how to show uh, children how dinosaurs were uh, dinosaurs used to be or how can we explain the refugees crisis in africa or um, the wall between mexico and the us so my question is apart from thinking about the next audiovisual contents in augmented reality related to entertainment are you also thinking about these contents related to information and education. Thank you. Well, this is a question for all of us. Well, from vision, we are very interested on education. We are working again, well, outside, because now we are not getting proposals, but with uh, the state of Georgia, with a GPV, we have developed an app, an extended reality app that makes contents adapt to the device. I mean, at a um, traditional training classroom, for example, at a, the high school, if there are five clues go and there are ten tablets and the rest having uh, have a cell phone, depending on the device that calls the app, you can get the content either in XR or in VR uh, format. So this way all the um, all the students can have the content at, at once without everybody have need needing to have um, vr glasses or google sorry or whatever so we want all the training institutions be aware of this we need to stop cutting trees and we need to start doing things with this type of content that it's much more visual it's much more immersive uh, because well, what we were saying before, the fact of uh, getting into a pyramid so that they could see how the doors lifting system worked, he will, he will learn much faster that if you uh, put a book and he, he, starts, he needs to read that content. So we believe in this and we would like to develop more education contents, but well, we, we've started by the US as with many other things. So a couple of references for you so that you can have a look at that. Uh, the New York Times is one of the most important media that is innovating in immersive uh, media from XR to VR. There's something that is really cool. I don't know if you know Googles that are called Magic Leap. These are augmented reality Googles that propose holograms. There's an experience of the New York Times that tells you about an event, this uh, Vulcan that erupted um, in southern Asia, I don't know where it was, but you can see the piece of news and you can see augmented graphs where you can explore the mountain, you have many graphs, infographies, etc. It's a good approach to see how we could tell stories about news. This, is, this was your question at the beginning. So, a documentary, a 360 documentary you can see in at El País, Vidas Contaminadas. This is a documentary by our virtual Voyager colleagues that explains the tra tragedy of uh, Fukushima, that power plant that it exploded. So as a journalism student, I'm sure that you'd like to know that Noni de la Peña, who was uh, the godmother of a VR, if you want, one of the experiences that she uh, performed uh, in California together with Palmer Lucky was about mm, de claiming against different things. And one of the most interesting experiences was that, well, by then, with those uh, levels of uh, technology that we used to have, it was a very poor experience from the visual point of view, but was highly uh, powerful. It was called Hunger in LA. And you could see how they recorded real sounds of a queue of people waiting to have lunch uh, in LA, and how suddenly an avatar passed out, passed, passed out because of, because of hunger. So as a 
journalism, it's really interesting because what you are seeing, because a, a different experience that they had, you were in the middle of a demonstration of people against abortion, and you were somebody that was trying to get into an abortion clinic. So the potential of VR to understand some aspect, aspects of information that could be biased is really important. And obviously the augmented reality level to be aware of uh, data at strategic spaces that make sense, that are diegetic. Well, there's uh, a lot to, to, to do and we are doing things right now. And well, uh, um, as regards uh, real-time data, we've been working with uh, Dow Jones and Wall Street Journal since 2015. And what we're doing is to implement every new technology that is uh, launched. We are implementing real-time data, the real uh, data visualization. So uh, four years ago, we created a VR website to see uh, the uh, the content on a web VR. We did it with HoloLens. We did a version adapted to HoloLens. After that, we launched an R core version, and this year we have launched another version for Magic Lip. So, I mean, newspapers, the stock exchange, etc. There are many people that are investigating everything that has to do with a real visualization of real time data and how to interact with them. Well, just to complete, uh, I don't know if you know this, I think that is still on uh, um, Espacio Fundación Telefónica website. I think that here, two years ago, we, hold, we held some sessions of uh, immersive journalism. There's a project where uh, Vision has participated, and many of the people that are here have participated, that was with uh, Spanish television that has uh, generated a lab of new narratives that has uh, researched about the uh, well how information and news can fit uh, the new me me media and some tests have been conducted they are really uh, valuable and i truly encourage you to to look for them and to seek for them because i think that will be very important references at least here in spain well just to 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 complete i think that two years and a half or three years sky the english uh, television channel created a VR uh, channel and when they went to a piece of news they used a 360 camera so you had the possibility of seeing of watching that knee that, that piece of news on two dimensions as you as, uh, as always or in 360 or even with your cell phone you could see what was going on if it was a car crash or something you could see the rest of the of the of of that piece of news so it was a different way of consuming that that piece of news i really don't know what they've done with this proposal but at least they did it at, at that time yeah el pais as uh, roberto was saying has done many things they have a channel that's devoted to that here in spain you will find many references the most important thing is what veronica has said in the end the important thing is to see it from a different point of view and to see the uh, non-biased information because one of the things that you can do with this is that uh, the information is not biased you don't look where you with where they want you to look at you can look wherever you want so is there any questions so can you pass the mic please hello well I'd like to share a feeling that I have I don't know whether to share it or not or maybe a piece of advice just to, to avoid it I see that despite uh, having immersive experiences we're still uh, designing 2D within those uh, immersive experiences, screens. This is related to what Bernica said, speaking about radio and television, what the television started. They used to um, broadcast radio programs. So with all the pro, pro, with all the possibilities that the 3D has, we still design 2D. So I wanted a piece of advice. I want to know if you share this point of view, especially from people that come from sharing in, uh, designing in 2D, in order to avoid that practice that I think that is really common. And I think that is, uh, that is really frequent. Skeuomorphism has a very valuable function that is to make the uh, audience get used to changes. So when we start to using operational uh, systems as um, computers, the designers had, um, had um, different chords because of the leather. So you need to link a real concept with a VR concept and you need to evolve.
as time goes by. Sometimes we make um, mistakes in terms of user experience, but sometimes we do it on purpose because we you design an immersive experience for a, a target audience or for a company that wants to implement it as an X uh, production process. You need to take these connections into account to make the learning curve more to make it to make this learning curve easier so that's why there are screens in screens and there are leather uh, agendas in windows uh, uh, 95 or windows 2000 so this is something that has to happen and it's linked to evolution of course we're evolving and if you if you see so there's a very important trend in the educational uh, market this is to educate and user experience not only in vr it's in absolutely everything so eventually we live surrounded by interfaces and we need to design them on a logic and usable way and apart from that they have to be beautiful so we are evolving yeah about speaking about what 2d can do by 3d what 3d can do by movies so there was a piece of news that said that John Favreau that uh, has been the one who has been directing or the remake of the Lion King this, his production team has used VR Googles and VR environments to create the movie because it was much more simple and much cheaper and much more practical to design these scenarios in 3D to use a VR uh, camera to see that this uh, shot uh, from the camera point of view fills it up or it covers a key moment of the movie so let's get a little bit away so that the, the point of view is better so as 2D helps 3D this has a great potential to reduce um, time, frames, economies, etc. If you're curious, you can look for how Star Wars uh, Rogue One was done. Well, they used this uh, tool that they've used in Lion King, and it is to preview, and it's really cool. You see the director uh, doing amazing things at the studio, changing the point of view, but you say, well, if you look at it from this point of view, no, it's really funny to see all this making of videos to see how the market is evolving and how these tools help us create different contents that doesn't have to, they don't have to be immersive. So more questions. There are a couple of questions. Hello. I have a question for you, for you four and together with Robin too. There has been really something very interesting that Roberto has said about the deficit of attention in the society that we live in, in terms of uh, abundance of information and uh, scarcity of attention, if you want. So linking this with what has been said uh, at the, the end of the, at the bottom of the stage, one of the things that the, the, this uh, this uh, generates in society is that cultural uh, models the uh, mental models biases are much more solid with uh, this uh, attention deficit so what's the role of xr in all its formats etc what experiences you've had uh, veronica and roberto have talked about that uh, already where this format of this new narratives can scratch and change this mental model or these biases that it is the prevailing culture so this is why we evolve Attention is educated. It's not something inherent of the human being. Uh, the human being is not attentive by default. So before this uh, time, well, um, in my generation, I was born in 1983. Since the end of the 90s, every child has been born. Well, my, referen my reference is my, my uh, siblings and his friends. And my other reference is my grandmother, with whom I, I test all my VR games, well, I think, that uh, things are, I mean, we learn things, and we can re-educate uh, people. We have tools that can help g young people learn how to isolate from all the stimuli and to get focused for um, the high school, for many uh, chores, for, mm, well, to, 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 to be, fo to stay focused. And as we have so many stimuli, we lose um, the uh, we lose the perspective. Uh, I mean, children lose this perspective. I'm really aware of that because I have two kids, and it's impossible that they can stay focused for more than ten minutes. So I think that this is helpful. Why you are isolating them on the one hand, and you're motivating them on the other. Um, from the VR point of view, you are giving them the content that you want to work that you want them to work at, and they are in there, and they are just focused on that. Although it's true that there is a part that has to do with freedom. Uh, you can look at um, whatever you want to look in VR because we have that um, freedom in uh, um, interactive content and motivation. Young people, even us, we uh, act in a motive. 
in a motivational way, if I face a very mm, ugly scenario or if I see a very cool scenario, I would move there and I can spend hours there. If I have a tool that I can use to create things that have, uh, that has a very user-friendly interface versus something very, mm, very rude, something very tough, I will move to that cool experience and I can uh, stay focused on there and I can learn how to manage my, th my thoughts. So there's a trend with everything that has to do with thinking, yoga, and how, how's the, the start thinking? So yeah, to meditate, meditation, yeah. I, 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 I don't do it, so, well. Well, I'm sure that tomorrow you'll speak about this in education, but there's a metric that's called Erga Dale's Cone that tells us that when you read, you're able to retain a 10% of what you read, 20% of what you are watching on a video, and you can reach up to 90% of what you're living and interacting with. So I think that this is one of the things that VR can contribute to everything that has to do with education. The fact of saying, well, I'm not only watching it, but I'm also um, interacting with it, and I'm practicing, practicing, practicing it. So the capability of retaining that knowledge is endless. Yeah, and I think that we are still having that uh, surprise factor of moving from a 2D to a 3D world. I think that um, I don't know how long it will take for children to get bored, but we'll still have that surprise factor in order to accomplish that uh, level of uh, attention and that effect on uh, future generations. But it may be in 10 years' time they won't be surprised uh, for what they can say in helmet. It will be like, okay, yes. And what do you think, Sergio? Yeah, what I was going to ask you is, uh, well, to, to complete the question, I'm speaking about to what extent you've developed uh, products or you've had experiences where you've been able to change biases. This is what Veronica was answering to. What positive uh, aspects you see in terms of new insight compared to all the previous formats that we have? I would say that the virtual incarnation, well, no, in the virtual in Spanish, you know, it's uh, virtual embodiment, rather, yeah. It's, um, it's very specific of VR because we can't experience it with any other means. And here in Spain, in Barcelona, they are doing a very uh, interesting uh, job of how to get into Einstein's avatar. It makes us feel a little bit smarter how to, I don't know, if we get into a black person's avatar, it makes us have less prejudices. So I think that VR can change these biases and it's through this creation of an embodiment of an avatar and getting into this avatar. Absolutely. I think that we still have time for two more questions. We'll end up with uh, these two. And there's uh, somebody at the last row. Okay, so I would like to make a remark and reflection, and I will end up with a question. Traditionally, I think that we've seen a reality as what something that we can see. This is the, the importance of... Uh, our of our eyes so to speak if we move to the philosophy world and neuroscience world there are many stimuli that get into us through our senses through our brain and they create that reality so based on this i prefer to speak about the fact that we are creating realities not to have that um, uh, difference between um, XR, VR, no. We are creating realities, we're transforming realities, and I think that that's very beautiful and serious. This has important ethical implications, and this is why I'm making this remark. I would like to ask what I was asking my students. In 50 years, 100 years' time, how do you think that this industry will be? And this relate, related to entertainment, I think that is something very important because uh, to think for the future and it, it is what could boost the innovation path. And I think that you could shed some light telling us how you imagine 
this entertainment industry or education industry in about 50 or 100 years. This is it. I'll, well, this was my final question. So it was a very similar question. I think it's amazing. But we'll, we keep this question. We make, it, we, we make a break so that they can think about it. And we move to the last question and we'll end up with this um, point of view. I'll add not only entertainment but uh, whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. No problem. So, um, where do you think that socialization in VR is leading to in the near term? Oh, what a good question. No, this has, a, this, this has its uh, own identity. So in the end, the uh, virtual reality is social, basically. And this is something very beautiful, and it's not being seen right now because we are in an isolated experience in VR la caña cuando te conectas a un sitio con tus amigos a vivir but when you connect with your friends somewhere I always put the same example but wouldn't it be cool to live the goonies with five with four friends and be one of the goonies and look for the treasure I mean that's social let's to share an adventure it's a, you go through the left you go through the right now we'll come together careful there's a monster coming along the pirates okay so that social part of living these experiences from the entertainment point of view, it's fine. But from the educational point of view, imagine about traveling with all your classroom mates to the space and being an astronaut. The other day, uh, it was done with a twenty, um, with twenty-five year old children. It was amazing. So the social part of VR is the most powerful tool that you, we have. Uh, please think about a dystopic, um, dystopic um, reference. This is very interesting. This is the part where everybody connects or, lo or connects to a platform. Everybody shares things. You can uh, play there. You can be there, but you are connected every single minute. So this is this is uh, absolutely the same as World of Warcraft. You know World of Warcraft, where you uh, plug in with many other people. You talk to to that pe to those persons. You go for a walk. They some people they are just trying to look for bugs in the game, but inside there's economy. There are different things. There are human relationships with whom you can well you can make a friend. You can make a couple. So what's the difference between a multiplayer experience with the real world? Practical nothing. So that's virtual, and there's an avatar that represents us, but we can have voice, we can have uh, touch, we can have many feelings. So it's really interesting. The future that is to come, the near future, is really interesting in terms of multi-user in VR, because there will be many contents. So this is about creating a parallel world, right? And in this sense, one of the things that was more um, striking to me Okay, so Facebook phase, uh, bought Oculus for a reason. That that's uh, that's uh, for sure. But something that was really um, curious is that at a VR server, I don't remember if it was VR chat or any other that I don't remember. There was somebody. Uh, there was a guy that had an epilepsy attack while he was um, talking to people at that virtual space. His avatar fell uh, to the ground. I don't know if there was any tracking or whatever, but the avatar fell down. He stopped speaking. He was having convulsions. And every single avatar of everybody that was there, from Russia to the US or Japan, went to see what was going on, how he felt. If an avatar went on, uh, walked on him, they said, no, leave him some space. Space, he's not here. And they were all concerned of what could happen to him. So we are facing the possibility of uh, reaching a parallel world where we can live a different reality that can be as we want. The cool thing of this uh, means is that we can have a level, um, a personalization level that is really high. So this is it, mostly. I think that Oculus Rooms, that has been working for some years, was... Um, looking for the, for this. What we can see is that VR experiences, well, you wear goggles, you wear headsets, and you isolate from the world, but you isolate from the real world. But you move to a parallel world where there are interactions and where you're talking to people. So what we were saying, we have been um, trying to have a virtual 
um, living room where you can watch the last episode of, of Game of Thrones with your friends. And you're talking with your mic and your friend is uh, uh, answering you or you're watching a football game. I mean, it's to look for the social experience inside the VR experience. I was going to say that we have developed our own uh, platform, as, uh, Javier, as Javier knows, in terms of uh, football games or concert uh, visualizations. And one of the first things that we did was to make it social, because eventually football is something social. I don't want to watch a, a game alone. I want to watch it with my friends to make comments or whatever. So we want to consume contents in VR. I don't want to watch football. The good thing is that I can do it with friends. Although it's in a virtual way because, for example, I'm always out of home. So the good thing is that uh, although I'm in Madrid and my friends are in Barcelona, we can watch uh, Barcelona against Real Madrid and I'm able to watch it from here. And I'm able to talk to my friends, to speak about different things, to chat to them uh, as if I were there with them. So beyond... Uh, so beyond uh, social sphere, this point of view of, uh, well, how do you see this in 50 or 100 years time? So I can only think in five, year, five years time, I mean, this uh, changes every six months. So everything's obsolete. So things are changing dramatically because any uh, share every shareholders are getting involved in that from microsoft intel um, i mean people that are building hardware are building hardware only thinking of a vr people that are creating contents are creating contents because of all these means that we have and we are developing things that three years ago were just impossible so there are many things that can be told but we are doing things uh, that are r really relevant that will change sectors and that will make everything blow up and to start from scratch at many in many things and uh, think in 50 years time well i think uh, it makes no sense i don't know if you watched the first uh, chapter of uh, black mirror that is it's telling us well i don't make i don't want to make any spoiler but it tells us what maybe vr uh, can be in 50 years time so this is what i can say yes uh, th that was my point but well it's so that i was going to make a spoiler so so that's even better so well if you watch that chapter um striking vipers it's called striking vipers it's uh, a point of view that has to do with uh, entertainment and with ethics or moral things all this type of things that have uh, so much to do with human beings uh, from the uh, implications that it has to have a different identity, a different avatar, a different um, existence, a different world to escape from your own reality. So um, I would say that, well, I, in terms of the future, I would speak about that. And uh, I think that these technologies are here to stay. Uh, they have a lot uh, to do in terms of education, training, and at entertainment level. Well, my dream was devoid, zero latency here in Madrid. And I think that uh, uh, regarding living a different social experience with other people, with um, physical um, touch, if you want. Well, I've lived one of the most uh, amazing experiences in my life at an immersive theater with one of my favorite movies, Le Moulin Rouge. I love uh, virtual reality, but I love reality too, so I need that physical uh, touch. So deboid alternatives for entertaining or entertainment uh, make all the sense. And in sports is highly related to the video game uh, world, so there's a match. Real reality, that's good. I'll change, uh, I will change the point of view. Technology for social change, uh, how society will be in 50 years' time, uh, because of everything that is uh, going to happen at uh, technology change level. When we have this type of uh, tools that make people get together, that connect us all, and this is what I was, uh, what I was saying about the multiplayer VR,
que cogerme un avión. When I don't have to take a plane or learn a language because I connect into a virtual room of the University of Harvard where I'm sharing space with the most brilliant people where I'm being taught of the subject that I want that is not costing me any money because knowledge is universal, services are universal, the language power does not exist anymore because the automatic translator is translating on real time what I'm being told. 160 people, uh, every person with a single um, language or whatever. Can you imagine that? Can you think about that? I don't have to take a plane. I, I can Im get immersed into a virtual world because the environment is reproduced, because I'm without people. So it's a world that is totally different compared to the one that we know. Because of the exponential change that we have in technology, we'll face many ethical changes that will redefine the paradigm of almost every industry, starting by education. That is one of the steps that will be um, one of the areas that will be affected uh, during this five uh, next decades. The fourth industrial revolution that has to do with robots, with more leisure time, with the autonomous car, that automate the processes mm, give the result of um, having more free time um, for the human being that will let us have think more, have more thinkers, will have more uh, philosophers, we'll need them, and we'll need to think what we are going to do with time, with that extra time that we'll have, and we'll have to educate them in balancing that weight of uh, social injustice. There are people that are starving to death, and in the, at the Mexico border, there's somebody that has drowned with his uh, two years old, two, two year old uh, daughter. So the world is very unfair, and we need to use technology to change that. And this is a great platform because it has everything that we need to put all the ingredients to have a great impact in the world. So if you have a look at the Sustainable Development Goals, every country contributes a tiny percentage because we don't have the tools. Everything is very expensive because money is not well distributed. The um, rich, the wealthy people in the US are asking to be more taxed. So we will have tools to break that gap. And the next five decades will be mm, key to save the planet. I totally agree with everything that has been said. And I think that we'll have to define with all technologies that are coming, not only VR, we are speaking about machine learning, we are speaking about inter artificial intelligence. And in the end, everything is like um, flying. They are pieces of the puzzle that they will eventually come together, so we'll have to redefine all ethical rules, living rules, and what Roberto was saying, the fact of a technology has to be at, the, at people's service, to be helpful for people. So answering your question, I would speak about five years, ten years time, and I would see a hardware where you can have uh, goggles, and these goggles could uh, be useful because you are myopic and you can have at the same time you can have a vr or an ar experience to answer a call if you're at the autonomous car you can uh, consume contents just just with an, another with another screen with a wearable for example i don't know how tangible this uh, hardware will be but in the end it will be technology that will help you in your daily basis so the connected car or autonomous car we all understand that it is one of the things that uh, will uh, mean an important revolution in the sector, but as Roberto is saying, we'll have more free time, we'll have uh, traffic jams, etc., but we will have to redefine all the ethical rules that we'll have in our society. So thank you very much, you all. Thanks to the audience for having stayed up to the end. Thanks to you for sharing your point of view and your experience. I would like to say to everybody that is here, to the people that are watching on streaming and the people that you know, that many of the things that have been uh, tackled don't make sense if they are not experienced. Que todavía sigue mañana y el viernes. We have an experience area that will be here for tomorrow and Friday with things like Matching Lip that thanks to Vision we are able to test them here. Sometimes, sometimes it's difficult to, to have this opportunity. From 10 to 1.30 and from 4 to 7.30 there will be a first round table. Uh, there will be a first table, sorry, where you can get a ticket to know when they are free. And tomorrow there will be a workshop of how to develop XR on the, uh, in the evening. There will be an education meeting. Um, and in the morning there will be another workshop. So this is the first uh, day of the of the sessions. Thanks for coming along. And if you want to talk to them uh, beyond the the picture that we're going to take, we'll be around. Okay. Thank you very much.